Well, let's take our Bibles and look together in 2 Kings chapter 5 as we complete this story of what we started last time about the healing of Naaman, the Syrian leper. And how that's a picture of how the Lord Jesus Christ is pleased to deliver his own, bringing them to Christ, even as this Syrian leper was brought to Elisha, who's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're going to pick up here in verse 15 for the follow-up of what took place after Naaman was healed. And we saw last time how, although initially he opposed the idea of having to go dip himself seven times in the Jordan River, yet the Lord used his servants to persuade him that this was the way that God had purposed that healing should come. And I see that as a type and picture of how it is initially when the Lord begins to teach us of his son and reveal the gospel in us that even though we say it's irresistible grace, it doesn't mean that we don't resist. This flesh is contrary to everything that would give God the honor and glory and would humble us. And that really is what the Lord was doing here with Naaman the Syrian, humbling him and dipping in those waters of the Jordan River, which for him being a Syrian would be considered as enemy waters because it was in Israel and those two were enemies. And yet the Lord, as we saw in 2 Kings 5, 14, caused him to go down and dip himself seven times in Jordan. And we saw that the significance of the word seven means completely that where the Lord is pleased to do a work of grace in the heart, there is a complete humbling to the Lord and to God and his will. And it says, according to the saying of the man of God. See, we don't come to Christ on our own terms. Here, the man of God, Elisha, is a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't pick and choose those parts that we want to receive of him and then leave others off. No, we bow to him as prophet, priest, and king completely, entirely, according to his word. In fact, that's the only way that we can find grace is through his word, him speaking that word, and him causing us to be healed. And it says his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. There's a type and picture also of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the grace of God, whereby because of Christ's word, when he declares the sinner to be clean, that sinner is clean. And in God's eyes, because of Christ, who is the word of God, he regards every one of those that Christ represents as being just as holy and righteous as God himself. That's an amazing truth right there to consider. Now, we looked at last time that it's not the water itself that was the healing factor. Water is water. And it's not a picture here of baptism in water being what is necessary to salvation, but rather the dipping in the water, as we saw last time, is a representation of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ even as Naaman the Syrian was to go and dip seven times in that water. That water represents death, just like the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I found it interesting over in 1 Peter chapter 3, that this is how Peter uses water as a figure of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So typically, by type, Naaman the Syrian, dipping himself seven times in that water, represents his identification with the Lord Jesus Christ and his death, 
even as when Christ came to be baptized by John the Baptist, and John the Baptist halted at the thought that it was he that would be baptizing the Lord Jesus and not the other way around. And the Lord told him, let it be so, for by this means righteousness would be established. Well, how does that represent righteousness? Well, Christ wasn't baptized for any need of purification, but it was a, a declaration of how he would lay down his life, just like the waters of baptism represent death. And the dipping in the water, the immersion, the burying, see the dying, the burying, and the rising again, that's what it typifies in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 3, picks up this very type in verse 20, 1 Peter 3, 20, speaking of the ones to whom the gospel had been preached in the days of Noah. And it says, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing. So we know that that ark was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, of salvation, and that Noah and his family being in the ark is a picture of God's elect being in Christ. They had to go through the same judgment as the world faced under the wrath of God, but they were saved because the water, the wrath fell upon the ark. And that's how any of us are saved because Christ endured that wrath in his body on the tree in his death. But here it was while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, and it says were saved by water. When it says saved by water, it's not saying that the water saved them. They were in the ark. But they were saved, that word by, through the water, through what it represented. Again, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That water represented death for anybody that was not in the ark. And yet God brought Noah and his family. And here it says few. That's a description of the elect of God few in comparison to the rest that perish, such is the grace of God. But notice in verse 21, every word of scripture is inspired and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness, God's righteousness. Here it says the like figure. So there he's shown us that it's a type whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Now, be careful because when people read that, they say, see, water baptism saves. No, it refers back to that baptism of water which through which Noah and his family went in the ark, the judgment of God, and yet the same way that Noah and his family were delivered because of the ark through that water, which is described there as the baptism, that same in type is the means by which we're saved. In other words, in Christ, because it says there in verse 21, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. So it's not as if somehow water can put away the filth of this flesh. It says specifically it can't, but it's an answer of a good conscience toward God. In other words, as I ponder and consider what it is that the Lord Jesus Christ endured there on the cross, whereby the ark was a type and Noah and his family saved in type of what it is to be saved in Christ, the answer of a good conscience toward God, notice, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So there it's clearly showing us that even as the ark went through that water and Noah and his family were delivered, so Christ went through the death. He called his death a baptism by fire, by which he was to be immersed. And yet the answer of good conscience, in other words, as we ponder and consider how it is that 
God saved Noah and his family, how it is that God has saved his elect in Christ by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's like entering into the water and then coming out. That resurrection was a testimony, even as Paul wrote there in Romans. Being now justified, he was delivered for our offenses, but raised for our justification. That's the proof that God has now declared righteous everyone for whom Christ died and for whom he went through those waters of death and raised again. And now it says in verse 22, is gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So I just wanted to come back to that this time and emphasize that it's not the water that delivered Naaman, but what the water represented. It's a picture of death. There was a dying of self, but it's also a picture of what Christ accomplished in entering into death and being raised again unto life and whereby now we're saved because of his baptism, what he endured. Now we see, coming back to 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 15, that Naaman returned. And it says he came back to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. I not mention what the title of this particular study is, but we're going to see it as we move on in here, and it's entitled Dishonest Gain. And we're going to see what happens here with Elisha's servant. But with regard to Naaman, the Syrian, he comes back out of gratitude and he said in verse 16, as the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And Naaman said, shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. And this thing, the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. He's already considering going back and having to deal with, having to go in as a statesman, as one who represented his king when his king would go into these false places of worship, what would be his case? And he said unto him, Elisha said unto him, go in peace. I love those words. When Christ speaks, go in peace. That means that there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in him. So he departed from him a little way. But Gehazi, so this is where we see the title of this message again, Dishonest Gain. Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master has spared name of the Syrian in not receiving at his hand that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. Here, Elisha, Elisha's servant Gehazi, who had been with him all this time, and had on the surface appeared to be one of the Lord's, yet now put in this situation. And I've often said, given the right opportunity and timing, we'd all abandon the Lord. Just like the Lord asked his disciples after all those had gone away, will ye also go away? The only thing that keeps us from going away is the grace of God. But now we're beginning to see that Gehazi was something other than he appeared to be. And the Lord will always expose that which is false. You shine the light on darkness and the, the light exposes that darkness. 
So Gehazi followed after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him, and he said, is all well. He was running with such haste after Naaman that Naaman's thinking something's wrong. And he said, all is well. My master has sent me. You see, this is where the dishonesty manifests itself in a lie. Just like Christ said to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil, who was a liar and murderer from the beginning. My master has sent me saying, behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. And Naaman said, be content, take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags and two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants and they bare them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house and he let the men go and they departed. You can see the deception goes from the lie to the hiding to the cover up just like Achan did when the Lord said, don't touch anything of the, the booty from uh, the defeat of the enemy. And yet he took what appealed to him and buried it in his tent until such time as the Lord exposed him. The pattern is always the same, that where the heart lies in darkness, apart from the light of the grace of God, which continually causes us to acknowledge our sinfulness and run to Christ. Here, Gehazi represents just the opposite, running further, further in that darkness, such as the depravity of the heart. And then, worse even, now, when he encounters Elisha, says in verse 25, he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went no whither. <laughs> One lie generates another lie. And even as it says there in James, once it's conceived in the heart, see, that's where the, the sin is conceived in the heart. Then sin breaks forth. The language that's used there is almost like bearing a child. The conception is in the heart and then comes forth the, the iniquity. And he said in verse 26 unto him, went not mine heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? In other words, is this why we're here Gehazi for filthy lucre or for our own gain and profit. Here again, it's the title is dishonest gain. And it says in verse 27, the leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence, a leper as white as snow. What a condemnation. But that is the end of all those that no matter how they appear to others in the beginning, yet in the heart, if the grace of God has not transformed the heart, if light, the light of Christ has not been revealed in that sinner, that sinner can only aggravate their state worse and worse. As Paul writes to the Romans, that they're such that heap upon themselves, wrath upon wrath against the day of wrath. And that would be our case were it not for God's grace toward us. So the lesson that we see here in these scriptures is just as Gehazi, there are many who attempt to gain favor with God through dishonest gain. It's what the scriptures call Filthy lucre, if you look over in Titus chapter 1 and verse 11, you'll see this is the language that Paul uses in writing to Titus concerning those religious leaders that were there with him on the Isle of Crete. 
says in verse 10, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. He's not even talking here about Gentiles. And when you compare Gehazi with Naaman, you would say, well, Naaman was worse because he was a Gentile. No, he was loved of God from eternity. And he would be one for whom Christ would come and pay his sin debt. And yet being a Gentile and leprous, the Lord healed him. And then you've got Gehazi that represents the circumcision, which outwardly appeared to be one of the Lord's. And yet it could be said of him, he was a vain talker and deceiver. Doesn't matter how a person dresses up on the outward to appear somewhat before men. His language exposed him when he went to Naaman and fabricated a lie, even using the sons of the prophets as his cover to receive ill gain. And here Paul says in no uncertain terms to Titus, whose mouths must be stopped. And that's the way it is in our day when we see so many who take the name of God and use religion as a cloak, their supposed devotion for God, and yet they do it for filthy lucre. They do it for personal gain. Here, whose mouths must be stopped, they're to be addressed as being deceivers and vain talkers because it says they subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not. They're preaching up men's works and they're adding burdens to people and requiring them to give more and more for what purpose? For their own gain. And so teaching things they ought not rather than teaching the one work of the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation and justification before God. That's the only way sinners are justified. So if we have an opportunity, here it says going from house to house, because that's where people met. But if we have an opportunity to preach and to speak to souls, let it be the one truth of salvation in Christ alone and not for any personal gain. Here it says, for filthy lucre's sake. That's a term that describes dishonest gain. It's not wrong to support those that preach the gospel. I know over the years, many, have contributed and given to me and to my family to help support us in the ministry. But my prayer has always been that I never do what I do for that support or speak to people in view of wanting to get something in return. That would be dishonest gain. And so that's what we see here being denounced. You can't mix grace with works. You can't say that salvation is by the grace of God, but oh, by the way, I need you to contribute to my work and to my ministry. Now, there are many reasons why people do what they do under the guise of worshiping God. I found over the years three particular wrong motives as you preach the gospel to people and others attend and listen. But some do what they do out of fear of judgment. That's one thing that I didn't see here, even with regard to Gehazi. He was so hardened that not even the fear of judgment kept him from doing what he did. But there are some that will show restraint for a while. They appear to be listening to the message of Christ, but they really fear that if they don't continue to do what they're doing, and somehow God will judge them. And so they put up a front, but that's not evidence of the grace of God. Others, secondly, I've seen do what they do to be seen of man. Well, again, here Gehazi didn't do this to be seen of man. It was just the opposite. He was looking for his own self-interest. And yet there are those that will actively, and it may be that for a while he served Elisha under that pretense that he wanted Elisha to think well of him and Elisha was caring for him. 
but ultimately he would be exposed. But there are many that do what they do and give what they give because they want to be seen of men. Like Christ said to the Pharisees, they sounded the trumpet in front of the treasure box at the temple before they gave their alms. And then thirdly, they do what they do out of desire for reward. Now here we've hit the motive for Gehazi. He's thinking that here I've been serving all these years and here's a man that could actually give me something in return. And so he did what he did out of desire for reward and personal gain and interest. And that's wrong. Like so many that will go through the motions thinking that somehow if I do these things, God's going to bless me. And they're always thinking in terms of material blessing or physical. That If I do exactly what I'm told, then God's going to keep me in good health. But those are all wrong motives. The only reason any should worship God and to worship him in spirit and truth is to worship him because of his grace toward us in, by, and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that regardless of what our actual status is in life, rich or poor, none of that changes the reason that we come to him. And that is because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the first point that I wanted to bring out here is that the grace of God requires nothing of man. That's an important lesson to see here because when Naaman returned in verses 15 and 16 that I read for us, he wanted to offer to Elisha something in return. But we see that Elisha refused it. And I see, again, as Elisha is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ did not come into this world to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That's what Matthew wrote in his gospel. But I don't think here that Naaman's intent was wrong. Even though initially when he came to Elisha, he sought to influence him by his position as being a captain of the army. And Elisha wouldn't even come out to greet him. I believe here in his returning, it truly was out of gratitude. That's what he was displaying here. Like one of those lepers out of the 10 that the Lord Jesus healed, who came back to thank the Lord Jesus. If you look over in Luke chapter 17. So our desire to thank the Lord in return for his grace toward us, that's what the grace of God does. We have that desire to honor and glorify him, but the Lord makes it clear that grace requires nothing of man. There's no condition set on grace to say, well, if I show you this grace, then this is what I need from you in return. The Lord Jesus Christ saves sinners freely and uh, holy and forever without condition. That's why it's called grace. But here in Luke chapter 17, we have an example of this thankfulness in the healing of these lepers. It says there that in verse 12, as he entered into a certain village, he was going to Jerusalem and he passed through the midst of Samaria in Galilee. And he returned into a certain village and there met him 10 men that were lepers, which stood afar off and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. So you would think that of those 10 lepers, every one of them was drawn because of grace. But like I said, there's different motives for which people will profess to come to Christ. Outwardly, it appeared all 10 were truly the Lord's. But as we read on, and they, they had the words, Master, have, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. That was according to the law for a leper to be healed. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. I believe that Elisha represented that priest for Naaman that after he'd been healed of his leprosy, he came back to the priest. He came back to that mediator, that one that God had established for his healing. 
And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. That's just one out of the other 10. And he fell down on his face at his feet, notice, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. He was a Gentile, just like Naaman the Syrian. And Jesus answering said, were there not 10 cleansed, but where are the nine? And verse 18 says, they are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. When he says thy faith hath made thee whole, he's talking about himself being the object of that faith. That's what has made thee whole. And you can see the similarities when Naaman came back, I believe out of thankfulness, just like this leper, that he wanted to offer some things unto Elisha, but Elisha refused. Again, grace requires nothing of man. And when he told him to go, you can see in 2 Kings 5, 19, just like the Lord said this one, go in peace. That's the words of Christ that, Peace had been granted already in him. This, this was one for whom Christ would lay down his life. Even so, it was said to Naaman in verse 19 of 2 Kings 5, he said unto him, go in peace. And so he departed from him a little way. But you can see the difference that grace makes because before, Naaman expected the prophet to come to him. Now, he returned to the man of God and stood before him. That's how God works. He draws those that are his to himself. And he said, coming back here in our text, in verse 15, behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel now, therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. There again, we see the grace of God to renounce any other former little G-O-D-S in which he had trusted and to acknowledge that there is no other God in all the earth except the God of Israel. It, was, it wasn't just the healing that persuaded Naaman of this, but it was his healing in connection with the word of the prophet, Elisha. And together, this was the work of grace it caused Naaman to acknowledge that not only was the God, notice, of all the earth, one God, one mediator, but that Elisha was his prophet. And so it is, whatever view of God we may have had before having had Christ revealed in our heart, all of those other views go away. I know there's some that say, well, can't you believe in a God of free will and at the same time be the Lord? Nope. All that must be renounced. Any that hold to a thought that somehow God acts in accord with their will and somehow in cooperation with man and his supposed decision, they've not known God. I'll tell you how you know that God has done a work of grace is that every other false notion of God is renounced. We hate every evil way. And we acknowledge God alone to be God, sovereign in all that he does, saving whom he will, and all the merit belonging unto the Lord Jesus Christ, we have none. So this is why I believe we see evidenced here how grace requires nothing of man. This is the spirit of God that was doing this work within Naaman. It wasn't just the physical healing, but the heart that the Lord was pleased to, to change. Now, when he asked in verse 15, I pray thee, that's another way, way of saying, please take a blessing of thy servant. We can say that Naaman only meant this to be out of thankfulness, he thought it appropriate somehow to support the work of this man of God that the Lord had used so brightly to bring healing. 
But Elisha steadfastly insisted that he would receive nothing from Naaman. I know I've been in that position over the years many times because there are those that want to give for the work of the ministry. And I have always asked the Lord just to do however the Lord is pleased to direct in the hearts and minds of people. We don't want to depend upon people and their giving to direct us. There have been times where I have refused to receive because in my heart, I was convinced that somehow those that were giving were wanting to control me, control my message. Now, we have to be free servants of God to freely stand, whether men stand with us or not, and declare the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And yet at the same time, without asking, I don't make an issue of receiving gifts. In fact, just the contrary. In my flesh, many times I push back, and yet that's how the Lord has purposed that others give to contribute out of thankfulness for the word that the Lord has enabled me to preach for them. So it takes discernment, but what's being condemned here would be the thought or idea that somehow grace required anything of man. Like you hear some of these preachers, well, if the Lord has saved you, then you better dig deep in your pockets and start giving. No, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. He's not dependent upon men to accomplish his work and his purpose. In fact, it's just the opposite when you get over to Acts chapter 17 and verse 25, when Paul was preaching there on Mars Hill, this has been a portion that over the years has been branded in my own heart as to who God is in truth. Paul was disturbed by the idolatry that he saw there in Athens. And while he was waiting, it says in verse 16, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. And therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews. In the midst of all this idolatry, here was this synagogue of Jews, but they were no better than the idolaters around them. And with devout persons and in the market daily with them that met, with him, and there were certain philosophers and Epicureans and Stoics that encountered him, and some said, what will this babbler say? Others, some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods. Well, I'll tell you this, when you set Christ forth in all of his glory and sovereignty, it's going to ring strange in the ears of people that are used to hearing of gods or a little god that depends on the works of man's hands. What did they find strange? It says here, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Well, if he's preaching the resurrection, he's preaching the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everywhere he went, this was his determination not to know anything save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so they took him and brought him unto Periopagus, saying, we may know what this new doctrine I find that interesting. They had heard enough to know that he had but one doctrine, the doctrine of Christ. Whereof thou speakest is, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. That's a good response. That what we have to declare in this world is different. Strange form is what that word means compared to what they're accustomed to hearing in their congregations. We would now, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. That's what false worship is. It's superstition. It's following after your own thinking and mindset. He said, I passed by and beheld your devotions. He's talking about different statues and idols that were there, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. They'd gone so far as to say, well, if we've forgotten one, all these are equal, but now just in case, we'll have a statue, a devotion to an unknown God. 
And so he says, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. When he talks about ignorant, it means being in darkness, no light. Any that are not worshiping God through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ as all of their salvation, all of their justification before God, they're ignorant. They ignorantly worship. They blindly worship. He said, him I declare unto you. And, and how does he begin? Who is the God that he declares? Verse 24, God that made the whole, the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heavens and earth. There's nothing that moves or lives or has its being apart from this God. That he dwelt not in temples made with hands. Notice, neither is worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood, that is Adam, all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, not only their physical habitation, but whether or not they're his spiritually or not whether they're saved eternally or not, is according to his appointment and the bounds of their habitation. That's why there are many that can hear the same gospel being preached and go their way, not thinking a thing of it. No urgency. Well, God's left them to themselves, but that's according to God's determined. But if, if such as Naaman, the Syrian, we are acknowledging our need of healing from our leprosy and sin, the Lord draws us through the testimony of his prophets and apostles to the Lord Jesus Christ. And through him, we find that healing. That's a grace. That's the grace of God right there. But it requires nothing of man. God's not served by the works of men's hands. Oh, how that has to be declared. And so that's what Naaman would learn here with regard to Elisha refusing to take or receive anything from Naaman as if that was necessary. But secondly, verses 17 and 19, back in my text here in 2 Kings 5, we see that the grace of God motivates the sinner to worship him in truth, where God is pleased to show his grace. And that's what I want us to see here. There was given to Naaman a new faith. He wasn't just healed physically. And we see that with his request here when he says there in verse 17, shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth. In other words, here he was thinking in terms, when you talk about two mules burden of earth, this would be for him to be able to use however he saw fit for building, or it might even have been somehow for the use of putting together an altar that he would be given um, to his servant, two mules burden of earth, for thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. Here he's requesting of Elisha that he would be able to take back with him from that place to burden, to mules burden of earth. And the implication is that when he returned back to his land, that somehow he would be able to have that soil and that earth with him as some reminder, whether it was to build an altar or not, of his cleansing in this new relationship to God. And yet, even in that, the Lord caused Elisha to tell him simply to go in peace. Because here would be a tendency even toward idolatry to think, well, since this is where the Lord healed me, I'll take this this soil back with me, Naaman said, shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant? He considered himself to be Elisha's servant now, even though 
He stood before him as a captain, now a servant, that he would be able to take this back with him. And uh, he said, for henceforth, this is the part of the testimony I want us to see here, where it's clear that the grace of God was active in him because he said, I'll henceforth neither offer burnt offerings nor sacrifices under other gods, but under the Lord. So you can see here his desire. And even when he mentions there in verse 18, seeking the Lord's pardon, when he bowed down in the temple of Remen, see, as an official in the government of Syria, Naaman was expected to participate in the worship of the Syrian's God. And he asked Elisha for this allowance to direct his heart to the God of Israel, even when he was in the temple of Remen. When he says there that when my master goeth into the house of Remen to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, that Hebrew expression, it's not that the king would physically lean on his hand, but he was indicating that he was the right-hand man of this king. And so in his official duties, he might not be able to tell the king of Syria, look, I'm not going in there with you because that's a place of false worship. But what he's indicating there is that even if I am out of requirement, of my official duties to go into these places, let the Lord continue to pardon his servant. I love that. And we don't find Elisha here making conditions and saying, oh, well, you better be careful so as not to get yourself in, in trouble or be found in a false place of worship out of duty. I think if I was for example, a secret service agent in the Lords and, and assigned to represent the president. And I was assigned to watch the president while he went into his place of worship. My being there in no way affects how it is that God sees me as a child of God. I'm not the one bowing down to worship. And so here again, we see that the grace of God motivates the sinner to desire to honor the Lord no matter where they may be found. And that's why Elisha simply said to him without condition, go in peace. What he's saying to him is, you're the Lord's. The Lord has manifest himself unto you, so go in peace. But the final point that I wanted to bring out here, as we've seen with the greed of Gehazi already in verses 20 to the end of the chapter, is that all professors false professors of grace will be exposed. There are many false professors even using the language of grace. And here we see Gehazi exposing himself, running after Naaman, desiring to take something from him. I think about Judas Iscariot, how all those years he walked with the Lord and even went out with the disciples when they were sent out preaching. And so subtle, was his state that none of the disciples even knew that he was a son of perdition all along. The Lord had told them he'd chosen 12, but one of them was a son of perdition. And yet when it came down to that night of denying the Lord, and the Lord said, one of you is going to take and dip this sop, his hand in the sop with me, they all ask, is it I? Is it I? They weren't even aware that Judas was that one. In fact, when the Lord finally told Judas to go do what he was going to do and he got up to leave, he was the treasure. They thought he was going to go give alms to the poor. Such was the subtleness. And yet, in the end, he was exposed, just like Gehazi here. And when he came and stood again in verses 25 and 27, he'd hidden the reward that he'd gotten. And yet, it did not escape Elisha's attention. Elisha, again, being a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. He asks him very plainly, is it time to receive money? Is that what we're here for? In verse 26, is, is this what it's all about? Money, clothing, olive groves, vineyards, sheep, sheep and oxen, male and female servants? 
It's obvious that Gehazi didn't bring all of these things home with him from Naaman. And yet what Elisha's exposing was his desire. If he desired what little Naaman did give him, then there's a whole lot more that's there. He wanted all these things. And so what Elisha was doing, as Christ does, exposes the greedy heart. And you can see the deep consequence of being found out in judgment, not having that righteousness which is in Christ, but a righteousness that is of our own doing and uh, therefore a false righteousness. It says there in verse 27, the leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee. No matter how a man appears on the outward, if Christ has not paid that sin debt, then every sin that a man has will be will be put on him. We, a lot of people spend their time looking at everybody else's sin, not recognizing that they themselves are just as guilty. But this was a severe judgment on uh, Gehazi because not only was he in his person a false person and a liar, but as a supposed representative man of God in coveting that which Naaman had. He could only think in terms of, of money, and therefore this judgment was all the more severe. But I pray that the Lord deliver us from the greed of this heart, and that we, by his grace, think nothing except for the great work of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished, and be content with such things as we have in him. To have him is all we need, and to have him is certainly all we want by his grace. Amen.